Hey folks, this is Captain Jones here to talk to you about design trade-offs. Our objectives today are threefold. Number one, I want us to discuss a few of the specific architectural and organizational features of the three computers we looked at so far, the little man computer, the hack CPU, and the LC3. Next, I want to describe the factors that affect a computer's performance and its power usage. My hope is that you can start to see how uh, the different features of these computers eventually or ultimately affect their performance and their power usage. Uh, and then lastly, I want us to describe a, the purpose of a set of tools called benchmarks and to list just a few. Okay, so let's get started. Number one, why do we care about design trade-offs? Well, I think two reasons. I, I feel like number one, um, uh, I hope that after this lesson you walk away with an appreciation for you know, the, the fact that the, that the design space for computing devices is vast. There are so many different ways to build Turing complete computers. Um, you'll see, three, you know, we've seen three of them so far. And if you continue your education in computer architecture or embedded systems or computer science, um, you'll see many more. Um, and so I hope to sort of broaden your perspective in that fashion. Uh, design trade-ups are also really important because the architectural and organizational features that make up a computer directly affect the things that the computer's designers, users, and programmers care about, like that computer's ultimate performance, its power usage, how much it costs to build or to buy, how difficult it is to design, or how difficult it is to write a program for. Um, so uh, hopefully at the end of this lesson, you, you can start to see um, how the little man computer, the hack CPU, and the LC3 might have different uh, performance or power usage or cost uh, based on the design choices that were made. So um, to start with, you might ask yourself this question, looking at the, the LMC, the Hack CPU, the LC3, in what ways are they similar and what ways are they different? Um, you can see the data paths here in, in front of you and, um, and you might already be seeing or thinking of several ways in which uh, they share qualities or that they differ in qualities. Um, Sort of my first pass at, at the things that, that made them similar or different are here on the left. Um, you, uh, you could imagine that they might be similar or different in terms of their architectural model, whether uh, you know von Neumann or Harvard or something else. Um, what's the, the word size for the processor? So what's sort of the, you know, the size of data that it typically operates on? Um, I'm not going to go over these numbers. Uh, in this presentation because I ask you to do this in the must-do exercise. The only thing I think I'll do is uh, specify uh, or sort of elaborate on these two rows right here because these could be a little confusing. I trust you can figure out the rest. If not, ask me in class. This row here, indirect addressing, has to do with the fact that um, is there uh, you know, a type of operand or a type of addressing mode in the computer that uh, lets a register or a value specify the address of the data to be, to be grabbed. Um, so that, that's sort of the indirect, uh, and then number two, can an operand be in memory? Um, so this is, this is asking, you know, in, in the computer itself, is it possible to perform a single instruction, um, where one of those operands, uh, is in the memory as opposed to in some sort of register or accumulator, or does the architecture require, um, you know, arithmetic operations, um, ALU type operations to be performed on only values that are, uh, you know, either in the immediate fields or in the registers. Um, what I do want to do uh, for, for the next couple minutes, though, is I'll dive into a couple of these. And number one, you can imagine that um, the number of instructions uh, between these three computers uh, is is very different. And uh, in fact, you don't need to imagine it. We, we kind of know this at this point, right? I've got the little man computer, 10 instructions, kind of limited in what it can do. Uh, my hack CPU is here in the middle, um, about 28. And if you've seen that video, you know that's kind of, you know, ish. There, there are potentially more. Um, we got a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of potential opcodes and destinations and jumps that we could um, combine to form various instructions. And the LC3, um, about 17. Uh, I list 17 there because I think there are 15 official, you know, opcodes that are valid. But you can see for here, the um, I think this is the add instruction. Uh, I can I can use bit number five to specify whether um, I my second operand is a source register or an immediate. So that's kind of like almost to me like two different instructions or two flavors of the same instruction. So when you add those in, you know we get about 17 for the LC3. Why does this matter? Well, uh, let's recall the performance equation for a computer. Performance is one over the execution time. 
So the faster or the lower an ex execution time of a program for a computer, the higher the performance. Execution time is equal to the total number of instructions that um, we're trying to run in a program, how many clock cycles it takes to run those instructions, and divided by the clock speed. So, um, you, uh, you know, if we have more instructions, then our execution time is longer. If we have more clock cycles for each instruction, our execution time is longer. If we have a lower clock speed, then we have a longer execution time. Um, and uh, uh, you can um, you can probably imagine that the uh, the number of instructions that are available to me on my computer has an effect on the number of instructions that it takes to run my program. For a given program um, that I'm trying to write for, let's say the little man computer versus the LC3. Well, I've got more instructions available to me on the LC3, so it probably stands to reason that I'm going to be able to take that program and and write it in LC3 machine code with fewer instructions because I can get I have more options at my fingertips um, than I do with the, the little man computer. So um, so if I've got more instructions uh, available to me, I can write a program with fewer of them, and that potentially has a direct impact on the performance of the computer. Um, so let's say um, let's say we want to make an improvement to the LC3. Okay, and we're like, okay, screw it. You know, we don't want just 15 or 17 instructions. We want to we want more. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine lengthening the opcode from four bits to five. Okay, so instead of uh, being limited to 16 uh, instructions, maybe we we allow ourselves 32. Okay, so we can we can pack a whole lot more into those 32 instructions. Uh, and let's say to make room for that, we're just going to sort of shift the destination register and the storage register down by one. The little bit field that specifies uh, potentially an immediate instruction is shifted by one. And then the immediate field now gets squished from five bytes to four. It wasn't a whole lot to begin with. And now if we can only specify an immediate value with four bits, it's assigned signed value. That means the range of numbers we can represent only goes from negative eight to positive seven. Man, that's really restrictive. Um, so uh, let's say... We're, we're going to try to change then um, how wide this instruction is. Okay, so let's take a look at the word size for these three computers. For the little man computer, it was three decimal digits. For the hack CPU and the LC3, they operate on 16 bits each. Okay, well, if we want 32 opcodes, um, you know, that immediate field for that, that add instruction got pretty squished. Let's say, okay, screw it. We're not going to do 16 bits. We're going to do 32 bits. So I've, um, I've got a 32-bit you know, instruction, five bits for my opcode, three bits each for my destination, my source register, one bit here for the flag that says this is an immediate number, and now 20 whole bits to specify my immediate value. That's pretty cool. Now the uh, I can specify uh, a signed integer in the range from like negative a million to a million. All right, so that seems like a pretty, pretty smooth fix. I've got more opcodes, I've got a bigger immediate. What's not to love? Well, um, there's a problem with this. Imagine the data path for my my LC3. If uh, if if my the word size of my processor goes from 16 bits to 32 bits, well, my register file just got a whole lot bigger because each of those registers has to hold 32 bits now instead of 16 bits, and my AOU just got a little bit bigger because it's not operating on 16 bit you know uh, numbers anymore. It's operating on 32 bit numbers, and basically every wire in here just got bigger because as I'm passing around data and instructions and stuff, I'm not just passing around 16 bits anymore. I'm passing around 32 bits. Um, so the LC3, the 32-bit version of the LC3 that we're starting to create is going to be much larger in terms of the actual circuitry involved than the 16-bit version that's in the book. Why does that matter? Well, let's um, take a look at the power usage. And it turns out that the amount of power a computer uses, it, the amount of power it draws you know, to run, uh, is directly proportional to two things. Number one, the number of transistors that are in that computer. And so uh, by making this LC3 much larger than it was before, uh, in order to try to improve the performance, we've also now made it a power hog, potentially. Um, and uh, so, so these, these design trade-offs, um, you know, sometimes you, what you take from one area, you, you have to eat in another, so to speak. Um, additionally, the power usage is uh, affected by the clock speed, and you can already kind of see here, right, that these two are, um, you know, uh, antagonistic towards each other. If I try to increase the clock speed to improve the performance, I directly increase the power usage and vice versa. Um, how do I, 
I can't just ratchet up the clock speed on a, on a processor. How, how does that, what does it mean to sort of change the, increase the clock speed? Well, it comes down to, to this little, this little diagram that has related to the sort of setup and hold times of these uh, flip-flops or these registers and the propagation delays of the logic that's in between. So you can, um, <clears throat> you can imagine that basically every, every operation in the computer involves data um, coming out of one register through some logic and into another register. And that's, if you look at the, each of the, the steps of the instruction cycle for any of the instructions, that's basically the case. You know, our, our fetch phase starts with the program counter inside this register passing through the, the processor bus and some tri-state buffers into the memory address register to get stuff out of memory. Um, so process, you know, pro PC register to memory address register, register file through the ALU back to the register file. Basically every operation in the computer involves some data coming out of a register, passing through some combination of logic and then getting stored in another register. And, um, and so my, how fast my clock can go is limited by, you know, how long my, my, um, you know, my setup and hold times and, and propagation delays are for, for this circuit. So, um, so if I want to improve, increase the clock speed, that involves, um, you know, sort of uh, making faster registers or carving up this combinational logic uh, so that the data doesn't have to go through quite so much of it. Um, and of course, doing that is making the design of the computer a bit more complex. Um, so, so at this point, there's, there's, you know, the, making this computer and trying to figure out how to design it so, to improve the power, the performance and the power usage is a bit of a, a, a difficult equation. Um, there are two other design relationships I want us to take a look at. One is how difficult the, the computer is to design, and, and that's proportional to how complex it is. Um, and so the more features we add into a, a computer, the more instructions we add, the more we try to carve up the combinational logic to improve the clock speed, the more complex it gets, and that makes it really difficult to design correctly. Additionally, how difficult it is to program has this uh, sort of bell curve relationship with the computer's features and its complexity, right? If the computer is too simple, has too few features, um, then you know, it might be difficult to program because there's just less, you know, that we're able to do on any given clock cycle. We have to sort of, um, we have very simple tools to work with. Um, you can imagine also on the far end, if our compu computer is very complex, has a ton of features, that also might be kind of difficult to program because now there's a lot that we have to kind of keep in our heads uh, about the state of the machine as we're writing instructions for it. We want just enough, you know, complexity to be able to write useful programs, but not so much that the computer itself is difficult to understand. Um, so there are, there are kind of two things that I want you to take away um, primarily from this lesson, those, those first two objectives. Number one, I want you to understand that when we look at a computer, there are, um, you know, more ways um, to describe it than, you know, just um, looking at the, the, the data paths or just, you know, the number of instructions or the number of registers. Um, you know, how many operands are in each instruction, whether we can perform indirect addressing, how wide our registers are, what type of architecture we're using. These all um, are different ways we can sort of categorize our computers that have direct effects, even if we don't quite fully understand, um, you know, the performance of a machine based on a set of design trade-offs. We know that there are all these features that we can use to design a computer that do eventually have an effect on its performance and its power usage. And there are different ways to um, design the data paths, the organization of a computer that affect its performance and its uh, power usage. So that's number one. I want you to just sort of appreciate that there are all these architectural and organizational features that go into these computers. Number two, um, I want us to understand these two relationships between performance and power usage. Um, performance we learned in EE360 as one over the execution time. And so these, these factors um, affect the computer's performance. And additionally, like we saw a few slides ago, the power usage of a computer is uh, proportional to how many transistors there are, are in there, how big and how complex it is, and also the how fast the clock is running on that computer. And um, I, I think in a future lesson, we'll take a little more, uh, a slightly closer look at this to see, um, to see that relationship. So that's number two, just want you to understand these two relationships. Okay, lastly, um, we might ask ourselves, okay, well, this is pretty complex. You know, uh, which one of these is actually faster? Which one's actually cheaper? Which one actually uses less power? Um, if you continue to study computer architecture, there are absolutely relationships. You'll learn that 
you know, you might be able to sort of approximate a value for each of these three. But ultimately, it comes down to something called a benchmark, which is um, we won't truly know the performance of a computer until we actually ask it to run a program and measure the execution time. We won't actually know how much power a computer holds until we have it run a program and measure how much power it's drawing. Um, so, uh, so benchmarks have become kind of industry standard for being able to, to um, compare two computers side by side. And you get to, you can see some common ones on the slide. The spec organization uh, provides uh, two kind of flavors of performance benchmarks, um, spec int and spec FP, which has to do with um, in, uh, operating on integer data versus operating on a uh, data type called a floating point. Um, and so these are, you know, sets of programs that you can run on your computer and measure the execution time to get some, some idea of um, how long it took to run these programs and then compare that against other computers. EMBC is another uh, organization that uh, establishes a set of benchmarks called CoreMark, uh, which are performance benchmarks. The EMBC also provides um, another set of benchmarks for power, so you can start to kind of uh, see which computer is more power efficient um, than the other. Um, so, so ultimately, these are what are used to sort of try to definitively say as, as best as we can what are, um, you know, the performance and the power usage of our computers. Okay, so uh, to summarize, um, the factors that affect um, or the, the, the architecture and organization of a computer um, have many features that we can, um, you know, choose when we're designing a computer or that we can, you know, used to classify a computer. You can see um, these on the, on the left here, um, and there are, are a number of more. Those you know, features that are chosen when a computer is designed affect its complexity, affect the number of instructions that are required to encode a program and a number of other things that themselves ultimately direct or affect a computer's performance and its power. Um, we um, recall that the performance equation for um, a computer is one over the execution time, which is given here. And we also learned today that the power usage of a computer is directly proportional to these two factors. How, not, what are the total number of transistors it took to build that computer and the clock speed? And uh, ultimately, it's benchmarks like the SPEC and EMBC that um, provide us with some, some, some way to definitively measure uh, these two qualities and to be able to kind of compare them on an even keel with other processors. All right, folks, that's all I got. Thanks for listening to Design Trade-Offs. I'll see you next time.